Hi everyone. Hi Meredith. <laughs> Hi Christopher. Hi Lance. Hi Linda. I'm just talking to the people who are on my screen, but your faces are all beautiful. <laughs> so here we are in uh, feeling the time. It's uh, at least where I'm living on, in NorCal. Uh, it's a summer. It was a summer day yesterday. It was warm in the evening, which is you know rare here, and, and it's one of those nice things where if it's warm enough during the day, it pulls the cold weather in off the fog bank <clears throat> from the Humboldt current coming all the way down from the Bering Sea. But meanwhile, some days it doesn't, and it's warm and it's lovely. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've now gotten used to the fog. So fog. Roses, dahlias, all sorts of things are up. Flowers, flowers, it's a flower world, the flower heaven. So let's sit together a little bit, uh, feeling the time, feeling what it's like to be here, to be you. Um, when we feel what it's like, life becomes more, in a way, we inhabit it more and, and it becomes more luminous translucent too. If you're just beginning to meditate, which means um, just noticing, beginning by just being, doing what you're being, what you are right now, always a good thing. So here we are. Letting the bell, uh, yeah, letting the bell sort of, hearing it, letting it fill us. And then it quiets. But it's, while it's here, it's a doorway. The sound of the temple bell, and all temple bells of all time are in that bell. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> what is the light in things? There is a koan that goes, uh, that what is the teaching of inanimate things? which really puzzled one of the old Japanese teachers and some of the old Chinese teachers. Uh, it's also in everyone, in every face, in every street, in every traffic light. What is the light in things? Just feeling here, feeling the summer, feeling just the goodness of life, really as well as the difficulties. And you can't quite tease them out and say, I'll have one, not the other, because it's, it's the old image. It's a weave. <laughs> it's definitely a weave. Have you noticed that when you have trouble or you feel sick, uh, you often feel more intimate with life and with people. And that can happen too. As well as that sort of, ah, make it stop feeling that we can have as well. So, so feeling your life, what is, it, what is it to be you is a great question. What is it to be you? And just rather than reaching out for it or trying to construct something, if you're very used to constructing something, it's hard to stop. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, there is that thing. What if you're not reaching out and trying to make the world into something? What if you're letting it come to you just for this moment of meditation? It's not separate from you, the world. So you don't have to, uh, whatever you're trying to achieve, there's, there's all that desire and striving. Just try being here and see what is given. Be 
being here. The last thing I, when I was a kid, that was the last thing I wanted. It was like, I always wanted to do stuff, but, and feel stuff and taste stuff and learn stuff. But it's also good to be here. In a way, uh, in a child's life, is full of being that the child doesn't know. And so we know that as children, but we don't know that we know it in some way. We have to learn it again later. So just being patient and letting the rhythm come. It's kind of nice being here with you. Looking at your faces. The famous line of um, Basho has a, at the moon viewing party, people are sitting around drinking sake, looking at the moon, sake, looking at the moon. Uh, it probably isn't that cold, you know, maybe it's summer, I don't know. At the moon viewing party, he said, there was no one with a beautiful face. <laughs> and, and, you know, that, you know, that's his tribute to the uniqueness of faces, you know. And uh, uh, we could say at the meditation viewing party, everyone has a beautiful face. It's the same thing. We're drinking meditation instead of sake, but you know, good, good enough <laughs> at that meditation party, everyone's face is beautiful. Every tree, every bird call, Feeling the time, it's what we can do. Feeling the time. Taking in the meditation, taking in the breath, taking in the light in the room you're in, taking in the faces of others. Uh, during, a, I don't do this anymore. I've gotten old and conservative, but I used to have, we, there used to be an exercise sometimes in deep in retreat. We'd have people in pair and then just sit facing each other and looking at, at each other without saying anything or trying to influence the other person. And sometimes that was fine, but a lot of people found it incredibly painful and couldn't sit still because what am I supposed to be doing? <laughs> Nothing, you're just being here and you're being here with someone. So it's meditating with someone. So that's what we're doing in the great temple together. We're being here together. A vast and wonderful thing. Okay, I've never really uh, connected this before, but I have a, <clears throat> uh, a sort of memory. I, I noticed um, I was sitting in a conference and I noticed myself doing this OCD thing of like counting, just noticing the patterns in the bricks in the walls, my bare brick wall. And, uh, and I thought, ha, huh. and then I remembered when I was a child, I used to do that, and I used to, I used to be incredibly bored in school, in grade school, and early high school before I learned not to be bored. But um, and uh, you know, you finish the work, and then you're sitting there while everybody's waiting to, while well, everybody's still avoiding the task or whatever they're doing. You know, all the kids are being kids is all it is. But um, I was incredibly, incredibly, incredibly bored. And um, and I used to look at the bricks. And then I had a wonderful experience. Um, I never connected the two until I was thinking about this talk. But a wonderful experience when I was in a. I don't know when this was long ago, and in the seventies sometime. And I was in a <coughs> Korean temple. 
There was a, 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 a Korean teacher, Song San, Song Sanim, who used to... Um, he was really an interesting teacher, but he didn't really spend any time fundraising very much or developing. Like, he liked to teach. He didn't like to do administration. And um, I have a lot of sympathy for him now. And uh, he... Um, and we were sitting in a martial arts basement with concrete block walls, you know. I remember looking at these gray concrete walls and the meditation pads were really thin because the Koreans are kind of tough, you know. And um, uh, and you weren't supposed to move and, um, and the periods were long and my knees hurt. It wasn't like I was completely new to the idea of sitting still or anything, but, but you know, it was incre- and I noticed that I was incredibly bored looking at the, I thought, this is the wrong environment. I don't want to be looking. I wouldn't be in a beautiful zendo <laughs> with shoji screens and beautiful figures and things, flowers, birdsong coming in through the window. And this was a basement on Long Island. And um, a martial arts basement with photos on the wall of guys going, ha, and, you know, and kicking and things like that. And uh, uh, But, you know, the person had been kind enough to lend the, his basement to Song San and people being kind enough to come in and bring um, cushions and and uh, so on and kind enough to cook although they would choose anybody to cook and often then you get sort of semi raw lentils or something. <laughs> but it wasn't it was a kind of rough in that way, <laughs> but uh, but there was something you know something came over me. I was sitting there thinking, God, I'll never get my corn and things like that, and uh, working with the corn and. Uh, and suddenly the the gray bricks became perfect and everything became beautiful and the people and the people in the in the dojo were trying so hard and the leaders clearly didn't have a clue what they were doing and but then i realized well i don't either so who am i to ask them to know what they're doing and it was rather it was very wonderful and and, um, and i I had this great joy rise in me, and it wasn't, you know, great enlightenment or anything, but it was a, it was the opening of a door for me, and uh, it was the first time I'd sort of managed to really have that happen in meditation. You know, it had sort of come at me occasionally with epiphanies and things, but this felt like, oh, this is the blossoming of something. It was great, and, uh, and I went into the teacher, and he, he. Um, he asked me a question. I just shouted at him, "Ha!" You know, it was really funny. And he could immediately tell what was happened. And he said, "Don't break my glass." You know, so he was just people waving their arms and jumping about and sort of being reckless to illustrate their awakening. So, so, so I, I said, "Oh, other people have obviously been in here like this in this state before." <laughs> so it was wonderful. So, but the the thing was though, the uh, the bricks. You know, the, the, even the bricks were a kind of entryway in the bricks. And so last week I was, this does relate, I think this relates. Uh, last week I went to, I, I got one of those notices you get that's saying, you, you, you driver's license due for renewal, but you have to come in. You can't just like, you know, fill it in online. You've got to come in and we've got to set eyeballs on you and give you an eye test. And, and you got to take a, a driver's knowledge test again. And... Uh, and they give you a few sample questions, which are, you know, kind of pretty easy. And I said, oh, okay. And uh, and I went in, and uh, having given some thought to when would be a good time to go into the DMV, which is known for being a sort of choked up sort of universe. And uh, so I went in about 10 o'clock, and it wasn't, I immediately, almost immediately got to see the person who was then going to direct me, and then they directed me to sit down, and then I'm G115, and they're calling um, G90, something like that. But then the next one is A17, you know. <laughs> and then I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> this is going to be a while, isn't it? And about uh, two hours later, I, I get to see somebody who gives me an eye test, takes my money, and... Um, I'd done everything I could do online, which, my my name and registered and things, but and they, so they and they give me an eye test and then send me to be photographed, and so I go and I'm stand there and be photographed, and uh, and then the guy sends me over to a computer screen to do the 
the test and and uh, there's a little just you and a little dedicated computer and uh, and he can see the results and so and you've got to get I don't know 75 percent 80 percent or something it's not rocket science but the rules are esoteric and so you know I did fine I passed the car thing and went back and said oh good you've passed and so and I'm just leaving he said hang on you have a motorcycle license too you need to go and take a test for that and I kind of I knew I had a motorcycle license but I haven't had a motorcycle for decades so I never drive <laughs> and uh, uh, oh yeah right and so I went and took the motorcycle license test and uh, and I failed so I got like 70% instead of you know 75% or whatever I was supposed to get and this wasn't too heartbreaking for me since I don't own a motorcycle I thought well I don't know why I would get a motorcycle and, <laughs> and my partner said um, you could get a motorcycle but it would come with a divorce you know so it was like <laughs> and so I thought yeah the people who care about me probably wouldn't want me to have a motorcycle <laughs> and uh, so I said you know I, I just you know I don't need the motorcycle license just give me the car license he said nope can't do that you've got to go back and start all over again because your motorcycle license is on your car license. And I said, yeah, but I don't want it now. And I, I don't really need it and I don't ride and stuff. And so he sent me back to the beginning of the line. And by this time, it took me three hours, more than three and a half hours to get to the, <laughs> to get to the um, re requisite window and go through the whole process again. And this time I, I didn't, I, Apparently the key was, I didn't really understand, I'm not sure I really understand it. According to his view, the key was that I then had to take the car test again and I passed. And also, I started to get a bit like, God, I don't want to, I sat down and read the book <laughs> this time rather than trying to rely on my memory from years ago. And so I read the book. How many feet from a, do you, from a, do you have to stop from a railroad crossing? Things like that. Turns out it was 15, uh, not 25. And uh, and so uh, so I did that, and then went back to him and passed. And he said, "Do you want your motorcycle? Don't you want your motorcycle license?" I said, "No, I'm not going to sit them." And then he gave me my license. So, was, so that was. An, but I was sitting there, and I noticed I didn't read. I had my computer with me. I could have worked. There was a lot of things I could have done, but I just sat there, and I. And it was just like being back with those concrete blocks. I was looking at the car carpet and there were people coming and going. And kid sits behind me and starts jiggling the seat and elbowing me and things like that. And so it's just, you know, it's like life on a plane or life life in so many places where we wait. And and uh, the whole thing being, what, is there anything wrong with this moment? Is there anything wrong with this moment? So, so I ask you right now for you, is there anything wrong with this moment? Are you in the wrong body? Do you have the wrong mind? Uh, yeah, would you rather, <laughs> what would you rather be than you? You know, it's not really possible, is it? And let's say you, you're dying. Oh, what would you rather be than you? You know, here you are. Like this, you can't, you, you want this moment, no matter how, what condition you're in. You know, and it's a nice thing to feel like, you know, oh, here I am, and nobody else in the universe knows what it's like to be you. Boy, I don't know what it's like to be the hummingbird that's sort of ripping around outside and comes and asks for nectar when when the hummingbird's drunk at all. <laughs> you know, so, so there's some sort of relationship and it's thinking something like I would think, but I have no idea what's really going through its mind. So, um, so it's like that. Only you, it's for you, honoured one, as one of the old... Uh, Zhao Zhao, the great old Chinese teacher, said, it's for you, honored one, it's for you. What if, the, you know, that was the thing, what do you, uh, yeah, it was about when things are hard, you know, what, what about that, it's for you, <laughs> honored one. So it's rather, rather nice. So anyway, um, I'm glad I don't have to go back to the DMV for another few years. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> but it was sort of really, really interesting to think, oh, the dojo on Long Island, ha, ah, you know, it, it was one of those rhymes. I want to read a poem, um, a couple of poems about, 
you know, the translucence of the world is, is a real thing. You know, you suddenly start noticing, oh, um, it's not quite this is all made up, although there's a bit of that feeling sometimes. But you start noticing that the substantial quality comes from our thoughts, the feeling, the formations of our thoughts. And so in a way, all you have to do is see through your thoughts, you know. Easy, eh? You know, <laughs> just whatever confronts you don't believe it, as you, as uh, Linji used to say. Whatever confronts you don't believe it, but there you are. And uh, we do believe it. But sometimes we don't, and we realize it's not that... There's a sort of spaciousness underneath things. And in a classical tradition, that's called emptiness. And you notice that. Like, you notice that about your thoughts, that you're really concerned about something. And then if you meditate, you're not anymore. You didn't fix the problem. But somehow, you're not so worried anymore. Or you're worried about something else equally as foolish, or equally that you cannot do anything about. I just I read an interview, I don't know where it was, you might have read it too, with uh, Sarah Silverman recently, and who's, you know, the, I, I kind of, I like her, I think she's sort of, um, she's kind of addicted to t toilet jokes, um, but, um, which I'm not that into myself, but, but, um, but there's something very funny and about the way she's always deconstructing the mind, the nature of mind, you know. And she's always offending people in some way that makes you realize, why, why am I offended, you know. So, but she said this great thing about almost nothing really matters, you know. Like, you know, she didn't get a pilot, she didn't get the show she wanted, she didn't this, she didn't that. And uh, she didn't say the harder things like cancer or whatever, but, or, but, I can tell that just by paying attention to your life, you start your mind starts to deconstruct, and the ways you see things start to de deconstruct. And I kind of like that, you know. I like that I'm not. The problem when I was in grade two or whatever I was as a child, looking at those brick walls, um, I sort of didn't realize that I'd made it all up myself. I'd made up the prison I was in, you know. And so um, it's kind of nice to. Nice to get out of that, you know. So yeah, so poems. Uh, his, his, uh, Czesław Miłosz, the great Polish and uh, California poet, um, about the the insubstantiality of it, the dreamlike quality. I looked out the window at dawn, and saw a young apple tree translucent in brightness. And when I looked out at dawn once again, an apple tree laden with fruit stood there. Many years had probably gone by, but I remember nothing of what happened in my sleep. And here's, here's something about the, this is something about the, the driver's license interview going wrong or taking too long, all those things. Um, I felt very clever one time. I actually renewed my driver's license at a little town called Mariposa on the way to Yosemite. And it took me three minutes. <laughs> the whole thing. So I think, I don't know, next time I think I'll take a trip somewhere. <laughs> but yeah, but nonetheless, it was a dream and I don't regret those six hours, you know. This is the, the difficult, this is about the, the quirky things that don't make sense. This is Valerio Magrelli. I love uncertain gestures. Someone stumbles, someone else bangs his glass. Can't remember, gets distracted, or the sentinel can't stop the slight flicker of his lashes. The guy standing at attention can't stop the slight flicker of his lashes. They matter to me because in them I see the wobbling, the familiar rattle of the broken mechanism. The whole object makes no sound, has no voice, it only moves. But here the apparatus, the play of parts, has given way. A piece breaks off and declares itself. Inside, something dances. The interesting bit when something goes wrong is always when something goes wrong. 
So next time you're trying to do perfect meditation, if that's what you're trying to do, or get rid of your thoughts, um, it's in there too. It's in the imperfection. In fact, it's more visibly in the imperfection. The, the, uh, the crow calling. And here's, um, here's another... Um, this is a kind of slightly lunatic poem by Bay Dow, Moon Festival. Lovers holding pits in their mouths make vows and delight in each other. Till the underwater infant periscopes his parents and is born. An uninvited guest knocks at my door, determined to go deep into the interior of things. The trees applaud. Wait a minute, the full moon and this plan are making me nervous, my hand fluttering over the obscure implications of the letter. Let me sit in the dark a while longer, like sitting on a friend's heart. The city, a burning deck on the frozen sea. Can it be saved? It must be saved. The faucet, drip, drop, drip, drop, mourns the reservoir. And uh, here's another poem about, pretends to be about something, but is actually about nature of mind. The house was quiet and the world was calm. This is um, Wallace, Wallace Stevens. The house, the Connecticut poet, the house was quiet and the world was calm. The reader became the book, and the summer night was like the conscious being of the book. The house was quiet, and the world was calm. The words were spoken as if there was no book, except that the reader leaned above the page, wanted to lean, wanted much most to be the scholar to whom his book is true, to whom the summer night is like a perfection of thought. This house was quiet because it had to be. The quiet was part of the meaning, part of the mind. The access of perfection to the page and the world was calm. The truth in a calm world in which there is no other meaning itself is calm, itself is summer and night, itself is the reader re leaning late and reading there. The truth in a calm world in which there is no other meaning itself is calm. Itself is summer and night. Itself is the reader leaning late and reading there. Uh, he had a feeling of there's some great thing that is expressing us. And we, you know, we like the iceberg and most of us is out of sight and all connected under, underneath. Let's meditate a bit more. So if you, you know, just uh, the perfection of things, the perfection, really it's the perfection of you, your mind. The translucence in you and in all things, in your child, in someone else's child. who's just as beautiful as your child. And you is just as beautiful as your child, as everyone, everyone else. So if we let that in, that here is the right time for us to be, it's the right time to be alive.
One of my friends is a teacher, Australian teacher, says, don't bother the traffic. <laughs> so, <laughs> whatever's coming through the mind, meh. <laughs> There'll be plenty more of it. You don't have to solve the problems the mind poses. It's all right. It's all right. This is the great time. This is the illuminated time in my life and in yours. And all the ways we rush past things to get to something else that we then in turn rush past or don't know how to just accept and absorb. All that rushing, well that's it too really. Even if we're rushing around, trying to avoid things, that's things. It's good to be happy with what is. It's here, you know. This is the gift we have. This is what we came here for, out of the wherever we came from. Whatever it was, a black hole couldn't digest and spat out, then that's it. We came out and that became a sun and became worlds and became us. Hmm. <laughs> Not so bad, really, eh?
What is the light in things? What is the translucence in things and people? <laughs> Do you see it? <laughs> if you look at whatever's on your screen, there it is. If you hold up your hand, there it is. A nice thing to have, you know. Realize that everything has its own worth, its own light. The rocks, the ants, the leaves. So enjoy your meditation because this is the fullness of life we're in when we meditate. We're in it anyway, all the time, but sometimes we forget or don't notice. You know. The fullness of being, the immensity of being. <laughs> here we are, let's have it, let's enjoy it. <laughs> it's kind of nice being here, I think, well, what? what, what, yeah, what, what? The nice thing about a meditation retreat is that, which we're doing in about a, a week, a seven day, but the nice thing is that um, we're not trying to get through it to get somewhere. It is somewhere, and right now it is, you are some. We are somewhere. We're in the vastness of the awareness of things. <laughs> kind of nice, eh? Inside the small sounds that are just always going on, the loud sounds are going on. There's always silence inside your own heart. Between the thoughts, there's silence. And the thoughts, you know, when you don't try to solve the problems they pose, your thoughts unravel themselves. And that's the translucence in things. Meditation, Ugh. it's really our life. What's the difference between meditation, not meditation? Nothing really. Um, let's hear a few people about the illumination or transparency in things. Alison Atwell, do you have anything to say? Well, during the meditation, when Jordan was playing, um, each note was some spark of, like a spark coming out of a, a fire and appearing, or like sparks out of a sparkler, um, we used to have in the 4th of July. And then there'd be this space in between the notes and um, the whole piece of music was like that. It was like a direct experience of the translucence of things appearing and disappearing. And um, it was so beautiful. And I just didn't want it to end. <laughs> and, uh, and then also I was really struck by something you said during the first meditation where you were talking about um, letting the mind um you you advise us thing to stop uh, you didn't we didn't need to construct things and you said when you're very used to constructing something it might be hard to stop and uh i thought that's um that's that kind of the way the mind will try to make something solid make something um make some solid problem that has to be fixed or something like that and and how that habitual way of um wanting to the mind just keeps wanting to do that and that's the sort of thickness of the mind where the translucence can't get through and i was thinking of the basho 
poem, the haiku that you that you um, read of uh, something like, in the moon viewing party, no one has a beautiful face. And that's that, I was thinking that's that part of the mind that, um, you know, that show is referring to that we would want everyone like where you see something and you think, oh God, people just look really unattractive in the moonlight and how some part of the mind just can't bear it and wants to be polite and say, oh no, you actually look really great. Um, and to have the sense of, oh, that, that person's face looks sort of ghastly in the moonlight. And it made me remember um, one of the, uh, it was, I hardly knew John and it was, I'd only met him a couple of times. And I, at the time I was working as a, um, an art teacher in Santa Barbara and we had these things where every, we had to do a certain number of days called staff development days where I think if you're a physician, it's the same thing or any kind of profession where you have a certain number of days that you have to do ongoing training. And every year they would always just hire these really just incredibly, in my mind, boring people. And I had this idea, well, let's invite John Tarrant because I'd heard that he had done staff development for different um, uh, uh, physicians groups and he was used and universities and things. So much to my amazement, my, um, my administration said yes. And I think partly because they had no idea or saying yes to but at any rate John shows up and um he's staying at my house and he we'd done some day with the faculty and then uh after dinner we were going to go for a walk in the I wanted to show him the canyon where I always go hiking in San Ysidro Canyon and then we very shortly into the walk it was maybe 10 or 15 minutes not far into the canyon it was late, uh, late evening and suddenly John gets a phone call on his cell phone. And he says, oh, excuse me, I gotta make this, I gotta take this call. So he's on the phone and I, I move, you know, a, a little way up the canyon so he can have some privacy for this talk, important phone call. And the phone call just goes on and on and on and on. And it starts getting, you know, dusk starts coming on. But fortunately it's the full moon. And the full moon rises and, and then the phone call ends and John said, oh, sorry, you know, it takes so long. And there, there we are in the moonlight in the canyon and we walk just a little bit farther because there's enough light from the moon to walk. And um, John turns to me and he says, um, in the moon viewing party, uh, and, and I know this poem and, um, and he says, no one has, uh, um, no one has a, he couldn't quite say beautiful face. So he sort of fudges it. And I think he says, no one has an ugly face or no one has a beautiful face. He sort of, um, but I remember feeling in that moment, oh, his face looks sort of not that great in the moonlight. <laughs> and I'm sure I look not that great in the moonlight. And I just wanted to have that like it was all right to have things be as they are, um, to have, and the kind of, that's that, the translucence of letting things be ugly, things be sorrowful, things be horrifying, things be frightening, things be, you know, things be like this blossom, exquisite, you know, things be as they are, um, is the intimacy, you know, that's the intimacy that comes with the translucence of letting things appear, whatever's here, letting it appear and have its life. And then it disappears like Jordan's notes in his music. Very good. John Bennett, do you have anything to say? You, you, I'm usually doing something interesting. Or, <laughs> or you have something to say anyway. Um, I love the that line from the uh, Aussie teacher you quoted, don't bother the traffic. Uh, and a few minutes later, you added simply, it's all right. Somehow, 
I don't know that. Well, I can't explain it. There's no explaining to be done, but it was wonderful. And um, the world became very light with those words. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. No explaining to be done. No. The, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a funny comment about that where, where um, these two legendary figures out of mythology, Manjushri and, and uh, <clears throat> Vimalakirti, and Manjushri says, our explanation of non-doing and no mind is that there are no explanations and there's no doing and no mind and he goes on and on like this and then he says what's your explanation of no explanations <laughs> and uh, Vimala Kurti says nothing so you know <laughs> so <laughs> it's that kind of thing <laughs> so, thank you very much <laughs> well said um Amanda Bouton do you have anything to say Sure, I can try. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, yeah, I've just been um, thinking about like willingness and availability. Um, and what Allison was saying a minute ago about, I guess just letting whatever appears appear and have its life and kind of trusting that and just noticing, oh, yeah, that it, if I'm willing to just let it pass through me and, and kind of, I don't know, I don't know what the mysterious inner move is that gets made or that mysterious inner gesture of going like this and just relaxing back down and in um, and just being held by it. Like it knows what it's doing. And the it, I guess, is just, first of all, whatever thing is appearing, which for me lately is really sometimes very sad or really scary, just like it knows what it's doing. If I shine the gentle light of attention onto it, its little fingers untangle themselves. And so it, there's the phenomena that appears and does that, but then there's also just the vast silence and presence that it's appearing in. And that too, if I just um, do some, like find some narrow narrow way inside it, then it also is like the great untangler of all the knots. And um, it's just such a, such a crazy thing, isn't it? It's just wild. It just knows how to do it. If I can, uh, if I can just let it, let it do the work. And the first time I ever heard you say, let the koan do the meditation, I just didn't think that would ever happen. I didn't believe that was a thing, but it's just, um, it just does. So, wow. Very good. Thank you. I have a friend of mine on here. Tracy Godet, do you have anything you want to say? Hi, thank you, John. Yes, um, the thought that I was having around the translucence of this life. Um, I had this interesting conversation this week with a woman who said, well, we're only about 2% in this life. 2%, and I was like, excuse me? <laughs> so she was explaining from her perspective that whatever entity we are, 2% of us is having this moment in this life, in this body. And I was reflecting on, well, that kind of makes me really translucent, right? If only 2% is here and what a fascinating thing to think about and reflect on and, and just sit with, like how interesting. Um, and then totally unrelated, except to your story of the DMV, John. John. My John and I were at the DMV in Arizona this week having a splendid experience. <laughs> and I was telling them like, this is the best DMV ever. We've now been in there three times. So, and they said, yes, well, we hear that we're the best. And I said, oh man, we came from Arkansas. It was just horrible. And then they said, oh, you know what's worse than Arkansas? California. <laughs> so you guys have a national reputation for the DMV side of things. But I love that story as well. Like what if nothing's wrong? Like that's, you know, like here I am six hours later and what if nothing's wrong? So thank you. It's wonderful to be with you all. Thank you kindly. So yeah, um, I'm, oh, let's just for grins, let's ask 
Mary Ann is clearly in Nairobi, judging from her wall hangings. So, you, anything, how are you doing? How is it in Nairobi? Anything to say? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's chilly in Nairobi. It was a beautiful day. It's so nice to be here. I'm always grateful when the Wi-Fi works and, you know, things function. Um, I, when, you, when you said almost nothing really matters or deeply matters, I thought I have this practice in the mornings of doing the Tibetan, the five Tibetan rites and then going for a walk in the giraffe sanctuary. I've talked about it before. And this morning, my walking partner, who's also in my sangha here, is um, um, very unwell with cancer. And um, this morning, and so she hasn't been able to walk with me for about a year and a half. And this morning, I have this practice of when I'm in the sanctuary and it's rained finally here. It's so beautiful. Tiny, tiny, hundreds of different kinds of tiny wildflowers in the sanctuary. And I ask permission of the flowers and pick a few and bring them back. And I have a, a Thai spirit house here that I do my prayers at. And I very much had my friend on my mind and, and it was a beautiful walk. And, and I came back and I, I put the flowers in the, in the little brass vases that I have there and kind of swept it with uh, some leaves. And, and there was this moment when I noticed that there, there must have been 20 different tiny blooms and it, my heart just, it felt like an egg and it cracked and the liquid came to the floor and everything was beautiful. Everything was beautiful, even doing that walk alone. Um, and I felt that this whole meditation somehow. Thank you. Very good. It's nice to love someone enough that we miss them when they're not around, they're not, around or not there or dying or anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't take back what we felt. Yeah. We don't no. take back the intimacy. Yeah. Let's meditate a little more. Um, you know, Jordan, I don't know if you're up for it, but if you want to just improvise a little on your, any instrument you have at hand <laughs> um, while we do this meditation, that wouldn't be a bad thing. <laughs> There's never bad music. The translucence of things, the translucence of our own lives. One of the old, um, one of the great old teachers, or a few of them actually, um, if you would ask him, ask him, you know, teach the Dharma, and he'd say, what is this? <laughs> that was all he would do. What is this? <laughs> what is this? Here we are. What is this? Yeah. What is oh, this, this, this? nice to be here. What is here? What is this? And it keeps opening endlessly. The gates open endlessly.
the light, there's a light in your own hands, there's a light in your face, there's a light in your feet, there's a light in other people's feet as well. Everyone you look at has that light. Good to know, eh? <laughs> You know, if you're in pain, you have it. The mysterious uh, power of um, meditation. It does that funny thing where it doesn't try to change everything, anything really, but things become smoother and the current carries you more. Like that, you know. Nice to have the current carry you more. And uh, I think we become more transparent ourselves because things don't stick to us so much, you know. And. Uh, And life becomes, it's as if we get unexpected help along the way, like that. And also that people are not strange or different to us, you know, there's no, no one who's, you know, comes from the wrong place or, you know, has, uh, there's nothing, you're perfect, there's nothing imperfect about you. you know. <laughs> anyway, I was going to call on Alma. Do you anything you want to say? You're allowed not to. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you, definitely. And um, it's a great question. If I ask myself, who am I in the light? I don't know. But I, I feel that whether it's it's the light or it's the darkness, I know that I'm connected in some way to the earth and I'm okay with that for now. Very good. You're very good. The kind of brightness comes out of the earth just to know the <laughs> earth. Thank you. Nice to have you on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, I'm going to ask Christina Schmiegel. As far as I know, the only Ukrainian person in our community, but yeah. You don't have to talk about that. I'm sorry. That was a unfortunately leading question. But hi, Christina. <laughs> talk about art. Talk about anything you want to talk about. It's so good to be with you all. I, I don't. I don't think I have anything to say today. I've just been absorbing things. I'm. I'm. I've been in a transition. I've been very um, deeply involved in trying to write an artist statement. So I've had to sort of be very. Um, I don't know, deep down inside myself. And at the same time, I feel a little um, lost to myself at the same time. So it's, it's been a kind of an interesting state. <laughs> so I'm just really grateful to be with you all today. Well, I hope the artist statement is the sort of thing that goes better when you worry about less and do meditation more, you know. So <laughs> it's like, it's like author blurbs, you know, <laughs> things like that. I have to say that it did make me feel like I have definitely not gotten enlightened because <laughs> I've been struggling with my own perfectionism quite a lot in the in the course of doing it. I had just had to write a, a blurb for a friend. I used to agonize over them. Now I just sort of close my eyes and sit down and write. You know. <laughs> and I wrote about her book. Uh, I said, um, the Red Queen says, is jam yesterday and jam tomorrow, but never jam today. That's the way Queen Alison when I said, this book is jam today. <laughs> so I got away with it with metaphor, but it is a nice book. So, you know. so yeah, that was my friend in Australia who said, don't bother the traffic, Susan Murphy. Yeah. So thank you, Christina. And uh, I think, um, I think we'll call it good. Um, I think Jordan, you're going to take us out, I think, is that right? And he's holding up his guitar, that must mean he is. <laughs> so thank you everyone for coming in. Jordan will do the vowels for us and I'll say a couple of words right at the end. So.
Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, you three playing today. Really nice to have your music. Nice to have your guitar. Okay, thank you, everyone.